have better presentation skills, and be more adaptive. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Um, I was going to say welcome, but you've been here all day, so I guess welcome to me. Um, how, and how's it been going so far today? Good. Awesome. So uh, one mistaken thing that, uh, that Daniel just said is that you are not going to be sitting in your seats for the next hour-ish, hour 15, hour 20 for the time that we're together. Um, so, and I actually invite you to, for the, for the time that I'm gonna be with you all, this is probably the most low-tech thing that you're gonna do all weekend. So you don't need any devices at all. So I invite you to put those away. Any laptops, phones, you know what devices are. Yeah, you don't need those at all. Awesome. So my name is Rebecca, and I am an improviser. So what does that mean? I am an actor and performer. I'm part of an improvisational theater company up in San Francisco. Up, yes, up in San Francisco. And uh, that we, we are a company that puts on shows regularly without knowing what we're going to do until we are doing it. We don't know the characters we're playing. We don't know the stories that we're telling until we're doing it. And uh, I also teach workshops and give presentations on improvisation and improvisational skills and public speaking. Bless you. So uh, I, I'm curious, anybody heard of improv before? Yeah, oh my goodness, so many people. Anybody, uh, what's something that you associate with improvisation? Comedy. Yeah. Comedy. Comedy, yeah, what else? Yes and. Yes and, amazing, yes, what else? Uh, drama, theater, speech, and debate. Drama, theater, <laughs> speech, and debate. Yeah, yeah, anything from over here, yeah. Being able to think on your spot, awesome. So it seems like folks have, at least some folks here have some association or knowledge about improv. The very first thing we heard was comedy. And a lot of people have that improv comedy. And that's not what I'm going to do with you all today. We're not gonna work on being funny. I don't even know if that is a teachable skill. Um, and improv is not about being funny. It really is, like Daniel mentioned, uh, these skills of adaptability and communication and presence. So whether you have any interest or zero interest in being on stage as a performer, if you are presenting, you are performing. There are some transferable skills there. If you're ever working with other people, if you're ever collaborating with other people and things don't go according to plan, which never happens, right? Everything always goes just perfectly. Yeah, okay, well, never mind. I will leave then. Um, those are the skills of improvisation that you're going to use. So that's what we're going to explore this afternoon. I will never put you on the spot. I will never make anybody come up on stage and perform or do anything. So if your word association with improv was like terror and fear and anxiety, please rest assured I am not going to put you on the spot. There might be some things that feel a little at the edge of your comfort zone, but we're all going to be doing things together and, and so I invite invite you to sort of see, see how that feels. How, how's that sound? OK, great. Here's the first thing I invite you to do. Stand up on your feet. Great. And uh, you're going to find an activity partner. And this might be the most challenging thing that you all do, that we do all afternoon. But one person, if there's a group of three or a couple groups of three, that's all right. But just sort of, it could be someone standing next to you, someone at the table behind you. Go ahead and establish that. And if you haven't established that, if you're looking for a partner, put your hand nice and high up in the, up in the sky so that you can look for someone else with their hand up to find a partner. Yeah, if you have your hands up, look around for someone else with their hand up. Okay. Is anybody looking for a partner? You're good. You look pretty you pretty good. Yeah. There's a group of 3 over here. Okay. All right, my friends, so I have a pretty loud voice and I also have a bell. Yeah, so if you hear this bell, that means take a look up here. Here is your task with this partner or in a group of three, if there's a couple groups of three. 
Your task is to see if you can find things that you have in common with one another. Find things that you have in common with one another. And there's one person you just came in. I think there's a group of three here, so maybe you can join back there. So hold up, before you begin, before you begin, there are a couple of caveats. There are a couple of caveats. These must be true things that you have in common with one another. These must be things where you do not call upon prior knowledge. Oh, I know. Oh my God, what a jerk I am. I know. Uh, you cannot call upon prior knowledge, so it's actually easier if you know this person less well than other people. But you couldn't be like, oh my God, I'm part of a student developer club. Yeah, me too. Oh, wow. <laughs> amazing, amazing, right? That doesn't count, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, it cannot be anything that's just visually apparent. So if you and I were partners, we couldn't be like, we have short, dark hair. Amazing. See you later, right? We didn't even have to converse with you each other. So those are the caveats. It needs to be something you don't already know and something you discover through conversation. If you see if you can find at least three things and if you knock them out super quickly, be an overachiever. Yeah, see if you can find four or five or six. See if you can find something a little bit unusual. And the final thing is to make this a little more interesting, uh, there's a clock right there. I'm gonna put two minutes on the clock. So see if you can find at least three things in two minutes, off you go. All right. How did that go? How did that go? It was good. It was good. OK, great. Uh, put your hand up if you and your partner found at least one thing in common with each other. Amazing. Some level of success we all had. Yeah, universally, you found at least one thing. Two things. Three things. Four. Amazing. Five. Six. Seven. Seven, yeah, seven back there. You're like, yes, it was to your partner. You're like, yeah, we found the seven things. Amazing. Seven over here. Eight, nine. What? Ten. Is that it? That's it. You're like, and that's it. There's a, it's not a competition, but amazing job. Yeah, great. Uh, all right, have a seat, my friends. Yeah. So here's the thing about that exercise. Here's the thing about this, that exercise. Uh, hopefully it, it was fun, at least a little bit. Hopefully you learned something about this person or people you didn't already know. Uh, I sometimes say you can play this covertly with someone who you've just met. It can feel uncomfortable sometimes if you're like, I don't know what to talk about, and kind of play, oh, let's, let me see if I can find three things I have in common with this person. The other thing is, is that it's a great it's a great way to experience the fact that you can improvise. You can improvise because at core, that's what you, you just did. So I gave you a container. I said, here's the frame for how I want you to approach this conversation with your partner or your partners. Three things in common, can't be anything that you know already, can't be visually apparent. And beyond that, I didn't give you a script, right? I didn't say, okay, first you start with food, then you're gonna go with siblings, then you're gonna go into uh, the, the preferred, you're like, that's exactly what we did, how did you know? How did you know? So you, you maybe did it that way, and other folks maybe approached it a different way. If someone said something, oh, do you like Italian food, and the other person said, no, I don't, you didn't say, well, forget it, goodbye, I'm gonna find a, a good partner, right? <laughs> Right? It's just new information. So you've learned something about your partner and you have new information, which means that moving forward, you're able to ask a different question or approach that conversation in a different way. And when we think of presenting or when we think of adapting, if somebody gives you an answer, if you're approaching a professor and asking them something about your club that you're, that you're holding on your campus and they give you an answer you weren't expecting, how can you be agile? in your response there? How can you really be present for what they're saying and how can you respond? So it's starting to kind of activate that muscle with this simple exercise. Does that sound, sound, sound all right? Yeah? Okay. Get back up on your feet if you like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great, great. 
And for this, you actually need some, some space. So we're gonna be doing a number of things where you're not gonna be kind of close by to your seat. So now is a great time to come in front of the table or in the aisles over here. There's a lot of space up here. So just, that you, just so that you have some space. Yeah, there's plenty of space here. Great, yeah, that works. Amazing, yes, great. Yeah, awesome, hello, hello, great. Yeah, there can be some folks in here. It's just nice to have some, some space, awesome. So who here regularly gives presentations? Yeah, or occasionally, you do, you will, you have, yeah. Yeah, so some, something that often happens with presentations is we focus a lot on the content. Content is great, content is important. The skills that I'm sharing with you all today and the things that we're playing with are not about content at all. You are the experts on your content. But sometimes we focus too much on content at the expense of other things that help us be effective presenters, that help us most effectively connect with our audience, whether that's a one-on-one -on -one meeting or whether that's uh, presenting in front of a big room of people, yeah? We get, what's the content of our slides? What's my message? I wanna perfect that. I wanna hone that and get that perfect. And we forget sometimes that we're uh, bodies, right? That we're a human, that you are presenting that content and that who you are and how you're showing up is just as important, maybe even more important at moments than what your content is. So something that can help, another thing that can happen is before a presentation, there might be some anxiety or some nerves, right? You wanna make sure you get that message right, you wanna make sure that you get buy-in from your audience, whoever your audience is, and again, it can be up here. I'm rehearsing, I'm remembering, I wanna get this perfectly. So there can be some nervous energy. So there are some simple things that you can do to kind of get grounded and feel more confident when you give a presentation or when you have a meeting. So we're gonna do a couple of those things right here, some simple things. So the first thing I want you just to find a stance where you're nice and grounded so the soles of your feet are fully on the, on the ground here. Yeah, great. And then, uh, and just imagine that your feet are really rooted on the earth and maybe there's like a little bend in your knees. And imagine that like the, the top of your head is like reaching up towards the sky. So you're feeling nice and grounded here. Yeah, and then just take a moment and notice if there's anything that you're like holding really tightly. Sometimes it's our glutes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or our shoulders. And this is an exaggeration, but sometimes it's like up here. And just see if you can let that, let that go, yeah? Good. So here's, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to kind of shake out some, some energy and get grounded and warm our bodies up, bodies up, birdies up a little bit. And here's how we're gonna do this. We're gonna shake out each of our limbs, our right arm, our left arm, our right leg, and our left leg. And we're going to shake and count to eight. So we'll start with our right hand and we'll shake and count to eight, then our left hand, right leg, left leg. If you lose balance a little bit, that's okay. You're human, hooray. You can just uh, regain it. And then we're going to half that. So we'll do four on each side, same order, right arm, left arm. I'll do it mirror style, yeah, yeah. Like you all are looking at me the other way. Uh, and then we'll have that and we'll do two, 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 two. And then we'll have that and do one, 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 one. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so, yeah? Can I repeat that? No, yes, of course I can repeat that. So uh, we're gonna count and shake, to counting aloud in unison. So nice and loudly, everyone's gonna be doing it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then eight, then eight, then eight. That's a lot, did you say? <laughs> You're like, nobody told me I was gonna be exercising, what? What's happening? Uh, and then four, 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 two, 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 one, 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 one. After one, you are going to strike your superhero pose. I don't know, I don't know what it is, and you might not know what it is now, you probably won't, but trust me, you will know when the moment arrives what your superhero pose is, and you're just gonna hold that for a couple seconds, and it's gonna be awesome. Off we go, ready? Put your right arm up, 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, loud, louder. Five, six, yes. Seven, One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, louder. Five, six, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. One, 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 one. Yeah. Yeah, hold it, hold it, hold it. I mean, this is amazing, <laughs> amazing. Don't forget to breathe while you're doing this. Yeah, it's so amazing. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's great. The one foot, the one foot. Good, and let that go, let that go. Oh, good, good. Awesome. Stay where you are, stay where you are, if you would. So that is something that you can, you can do, right? So it like lets out that nervous energy, it gets you warmed up, it gets you out of like the chatter in your brain. That's not always useful. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not useful, yeah? And just gets you here. So you can do that before a meeting, even just like uh, modulate it and do it a little bit. Okay, yeah. Here's another thing. I want you to take a stance Take a stance that feels like a, a little power pose there. It could be your superhero pose. Anything that's nice and open, um, amazing like this, that's great, or like this, or like this. I like the Megan Rapino pose, Megan Rapino go pose. Um, and you're just gonna strike that pose and feel nice and grounded here, yeah? And what you're gonna say, and we'll practice this a little bit uh, in, different, in different groups, and you're going to say your name and, and that you're here. So it might look like this. You can put your hands down. Nobody has their hands up. Okay, great. <laughs> you're like, we're not putting our hands up. So it might look something like this. I am Rebecca and I am here. Yes, would you do that please? Would everyone clap? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, great. Yeah, that might be the hardest part when other people are clapping and you're like, no, I cannot take that applause. No, 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 no. It feels weird. I want to go away and go back to my laptop. Yeah. Uh, so that it actually can feel really hard for us to do that, right? Uh, is just to say, and there doesn't need to be any more embellishment. Like you don't need to say, I'm Rebecca and I'm here and I'm here because da 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 da. And what da 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 da. It's just this is who I am and I'm here and it's enough, it's enough. I don't have to deliver my message yet. It's again, just feeling like confident before I go into a conversation or a meeting that might feel a little intimidating or I'm having some nerves, yeah? Does that sound, sound about right? So here's what you're going to do. Find yourself in a group of about four people. Find yourself in a group of about four or five people, yeah. Great. Lovely. And here's something, here's a little tool for this afternoon. If, you, if you're we're ever doing something where you need to find a partner and you see someone who's looking something like this, like looking for a partner or someone, go, go like this. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Everyone try that. Come here, 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 come here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Okay, good. So in your group, in your small group here, in your small group here, you are going to do I am here. And you'll just one person at a time. And you'll just go around and one person will strike their pose. And this might feel very strange. Try, I invite you to just try it and you just say, I am, say your name, and I am here. And then breathe and let the other people clap for you for a couple of seconds before you move on. <laughs> Flag me down if you have questions. I'll come around and check in. Off you go.
with your group but see other people clapping, join in for, to clap for a person. Did everyone get to go? Keep going if you haven't gone yet. Yes, yes, make sure that everyone, everyone receives some applause. Yeah? Great. Uh, turn, look at the other people in your group and say, thank you so much. Thank you. Really great. Yeah, thank you. Great. Great. Stay where you are. Stay where you are for a moment. And once again, the time has arrived where you're going to find another activity partner. And this, I need you to find just one other person. So we need to be in groups of two. And if you, if you need a partner, raise your hand. If you are looking for a partner and see someone with their hand raised, say, come here, come here. I'm going to count back from 10. And when I get to one, you're going to have a new partner, someone not in this small group you were just part of. Yes, yeah, someone not in this small group. You might need to walk around. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. If you're looking for a partner, come, come down here so that the people who need a partner can find one another. Yeah, OK. Did that work out? Amazing. All right. Uh, are, are you looking for a partner? Are you, you are? Will you, uh, that's OK. It's all right. Uh, are there, is there anyone else that's looking for a partner? So uh, what we, He's welcome here. Uh, so can I actually have, uh, uh, I'll, I'll partner with someone. And uh, can I have someone come volunteer? I won't make you partner with me. It's a, it's a, yeah, you'll do it. OK, great. Yeah! Awesome. What is your name? Maxine. Maxine, so great. So the person who, uh, who was your partner over here? Great, so Katie, you're gonna be the partner of the person who needed a partner here. Yeah, amazing. We did it. We did it. I always think it would be funny if like, this was the end of the exercise, if it was like, okay, that's it, and now we're, <laughs> now we're done. But it's not, but it's not. So here, Maxine, mm -hmm. awesome. Okay, so Maxine, thank you so much for volunteering and not leaving me up here by myself. Um, so here's what's going to happen, and Maxine and I will demo this, it is that you are going to count to three with your partner. You're going to count to three with your partner, and there's a particular way, and we don't really need that, but that's up there anyway. Uh, sure. Uh, there's a particular way you're going to count to three together, and it's that you're going to alternate numbers, and you're just going to go back and forth. When you get to three, you'll go back to one. So just watch. Uh, Maxine, you've never done this before, right? No. Okay, amazing, great. So you're going to turn and face your partner when you begin, and it might look something like this. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Two, one, two. three. Two. Wait, hold on. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, great. So that's how it looks. Just We're just going to do that on a loop, just going back and forth. One, two, three, one, two, three. Here's the thing. See if you can go faster than you think you can go. See if you can go faster than you think you can go. And don't forget to breathe. Off you go. When I ring the bell, look here. OK, okay ready? One, two, three. Wait, okay, okay? <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four. Oh my god! I'm getting, I was so good at it before, okay. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, 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 one, two, two, wait, three. One, two, three. Yeah, great. Actually really hard. Awesome. Yeah, will you stay up here? Yeah. Okay, I know. okay, great. All right, counters. Yeah, great, great. How's it going? <laughs> great. Okay, so uh, you might be having the experience where you're like, why was that so hard? What? I thought I knew how to count, and I don't. Okay, so. Uh, Stay with this partner. You're going to count to three together. You're going to count in a loop. When you get to three, you'll go back to one. You're going to go faster than you think you can go, alternating numbers. There is a modification for this next round. And the modification is that instead of saying the number one, we're going to replace the number one with a clap. 
We'll still say the numbers two and three, so it might look something like this. Two. Three. Two. Three. Two. Wait. Three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clap for one. Say two. Say three. Go faster than you think you can go. Off you go. Okay. Two. Three. One. Two. Three. 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 Two. All right. All right, great. Yay. How's it going? Yeah, I'm going to... Who, who made a mistake at any point? Hooray, you're human. <laughs> Hooray. Great. Yeah, again, universally, pretty much we, we all made a mistake. So uh, we're going to take a slight detour, and then you're going to uh, stay with this counting partner. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, I know there was a lot happening. There's someone who you've met just recently who you're standing and, like, making eye contact with. That, that enough might feel awkward. Right? That might feel like, what? This is weird. Then you're counting in a way you haven't counted before. There's a lot happening. Then I added this clap. What is she doing? Oh my God. Uh, but I'm curious if anybody noticed what happens in that moment immediately after you made a mistake. You don't have to stay up here right now, but I'm going to need you oh, in just a minute, okay. Maxine. Okay. Don't go far. Don't go far. Anybody know, recognize what? Yeah, what happened? You laughed, it off. you laughed it off. What else happened in that moment? You made a mistake. Yeah, right there. You kept going after it. Did you notice anything that happened physically or vocally? Was there something you did or said? But even before you kept going, yeah. You pointed it out with laughter. Yeah, what else? Over here, was there somebody? Yeah, back there. You looked away. You looked away. Yeah. You came up with an algorithm. Engineers, amazing. I work with a lot of engineers and people are like, yeah, here, I solved the problem. Here it is, amazing. So, um, so this is a very, these things are very familiar reactions when we make a mistake. Sometimes we laugh, sometimes it's nervous laughter. <laughs> right. Sometimes it's looking away, losing that eye contact that you were holding to count, you look away. Sometimes there's stepping back a little bit. Sometimes there's this oof. Or even it might not be that pronounced, but just a little bit where it's sort of cringing and going inward. Or doing this, uh, beating yourself up. These sort of very familiar, even if we don't do those, those very familiar internal reactions of what happens when we make a mistake. Yeah, does that sound f familiar? Yeah, it's like, oh. Stupid, it's so, so stupid. So there's a tool that we've come up with. Um, by we, I mean improvisers. By we, I mean the royal we. No, uh, improvisers have come up with to help sort of retrain what our immediate reaction is when we make a mistake. Anybody watch gymnasts ever or uh, Flying trapeze artists, yeah. What do those folks do at the end of a routine? They do a routine, yeah, that's it, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's it, they stick it, right? They stick it. Whether they have nailed it and gotten a perfect 10 or whether there have been some errors, there's always this beautiful opening up, this bow at the end. If you've ever seen a flying trapeze artist, that's really hard, it's really hard and scary. If they fall off into the net, they fall into the net and then bounce up and it's like, I'm okay. Yeah, I fell off, I'm okay. So here, I'm gonna invite you to do this. This might feel a little strange, but stay with me if you would. Wherever you are, open your body up nice and wide like this and you're going to say, I failed, I failed. Oh, beautiful, say, ta-da! Say woohoo! Woo Amazing. Turn to your counting partner and say, I failed! I failed! And say to them, ta da! Ta da! Say woohoo! Woohoo! Yeah, great! <laughs> great! Amazing! Yeah. So that is, uh, that's what we affect.
affectionately call the failure bow, yeah? And you are going to practice using the failure bow because you're going to go back to your counting partner and you're going to count to three in a loop, going faster than you think you can go. You're going to clap instead of saying the number one. You're going to snap instead of saying the number two. You're going to say the number three. And anytime you make a mistake, before you get started, I love the enthusiasm. You're like, we're, go we're going, we're doing it, we're gonna win. Before you get started, before you get started, um, clap for one, snap for two, say three. Anytime you make a mistake, and I don't care what kind of mistake, if you do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, if you just have a moment where you're like, I forgot what numbers are, like I don't. I'm gone. Whatever kind of mistake, if you aren't sure if you've made a mistake, fantastic. You're going to fail your bow. And you can use whatever feels good, right? One of those probably felt like a little more comfortable or a little more fun for you. Ta-da, I failed, or woohoo. Just try that. If you aren't failure bowing, you're probably going too slowly. Yeah, you're probably going too slowly. The last thing I will say is, if you are having a moment where you're like, oh God, I don't know how to snap my fingers and now my partner's gonna know I'm, I'm so embarrassed. No, there's no need to be embarrassed. You just make like the snapping motion. Yeah, clap for one, snap for two, say three. Failure about when you make a mistake, off you go. All right, Maxine, you wanna come up here? Okay. Three. 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 Woohoo! I failed. No, I failed, right? I, I failed. Yeah. Okay. Two. Three. I failed. Okay. Three. 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 Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> You stay right here with me, Maxine. Thank you so much. All right. Maxine, it's, it's true. <laughs> Suddenly I'm like, we're doing a routine. No, we're not. Uh, Maxine, it's true. There's another number. There's one more number. So you're, st you're going to stay with this counting partner just a little bit longer. You're going to clap instead of saying one. You're going to snap instead of saying two. And you're going to stomp instead of saying three. And there's one more modification. This time, some of you might have been doing this already, but uh, so continue this if you were, and if you weren't, this time make sure that anytime either you or your partner makes a mistake, that both of you fail your bow. And you could be saying different things, like I might say ta-da, and you might say woohoo, it doesn't matter, but that we're both failure bowing. So instead of it being like, I'm terrible and stupid, right? Or like, and the other person like, yeah, that's right, you messed up, mm-hmm. Right, ta-da, and then pick it up. Off you go. Woohoo! Okay. Ta-da! What? Ta-da! 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 Amazing. My friends, we have run out of numbers. We've run out of numbers to replace. But uh, at this moment, I invite you to go back to that very first iteration of counting to three with your partner. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, and see if that feels different at all. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, 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 one, two, So, so be 
before you part ways with this partner who you have gone on this bizarre counting journey with, uh, have a little check-in conversation with them about how that whole thing went, what you noticed, what felt challenging, what felt easy, anything that just came up in doing that exercise. Off you go, a little 30-second check-in. That was fun. Yeah. I think the last, well, I got better at it at the end of it, but the first one I was kind of like nervous, I was kind of confused. Yeah. But like now I'm just like familiar. Like the whole stop thing, top thing, I was so confused. Yeah. Like the end, I just like, I'm good at it now. I just yeah. like challenge my like critical thinking. How was the failure bow for you? Oh, yeah. I like Did that. you like it? Yeah. yeah. Because it's like acknowledgement. It's, like, it's okay to fail. Yeah. I was like, because like usually I'm just like a little stupid, like whatever. Yeah. Like now that like we're both acknowledged, it's like okay, that we just move on. And then we'll laugh about it. Totally. I've been like, oh, so. Yay. Yeah. And it got easier, right? Yeah. When we went back to the one, two, three, it got so one, much two, three, easier. it got a lot. I was like, oh, good at this. I was like, oh, that's not Yeah. I like selectivity. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, Maxine. All right, reports from the field. Reports from the field. I'd love to hear from a few folks. Yeah, back there, and I think we might have some microphones if we need something, if we need, is that true? A couple handheld mics. Da Daniel's like, yes, we can get we can get a handheld mic. Yeah, yes, great. I figured out how to count. <laughs> great, figured out how to count. Yeah, amazing. You did it, yes, yes. Great, what else? Over, uh, yeah. Well. I learned how to keep eye contact. I felt more comfortable keeping eye contact with my partner after yeah. a while. So, and that failure rate, <laughs> I was, we were like, oh, it's nothing. We cool. failed. Cool. <laughs> so you found that initially that eye contact was hard to, or maybe just felt uncomfortable? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm really introverted, so. Absolutely. Yeah, and kind of prolonged eye contact. Yeah, there's someone behind you. There are a couple of other comments. We'll hear from folks. Yeah, up here. So we figured out for counting one, two, three, we don't need to think. If we think, we mess it up. If we don't think, just listen. Like, our memory will help us. Yeah, so think <laughs> thinking can get in the way sometimes, right? It's not like never think, right? Just act without thinking. But sometimes that we're planning ahead or thinking rather than actually responding to what's happening. Even if we know the order, right? One, two, three, we know what's happening after three being present can help. Yeah, a couple more comments. Yeah, over here. So, oh. um, yeah. so after a while, we figured out that it's a pattern. So I just kept saying two, one, three, and she said one, three, two, and that's how it just keeps going on and on and on yeah. without a mistake, and we're, much, we're going much faster. Yeah. So, that, so you, you problem solved. Yes, engineers, problem solving. Amazing, thank you. Um, I'm curious to know, oh yeah, back, back there, and oh, then yeah. I have a question. Oh, yeah. No, we don't have a question. We're just going to give our inputs. We also learned how to count, by the way, but this time with <laughs> one instead of zero, because I believe that everybody is a computer scientist here. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To hell with zero index, huh? So, um, so I'm, I love that there are so many comments. I actually uh, am curious how the failure bow felt. And if you're like, it felt really weird, that's, that's all right. But yeah, how did, it, how did it feel? Yeah, back there. Yeah, actually, both of our first instincts when we were doing the failure bow was to do it together. Cool. And, like, it really felt completely normal and natural for us to just do it. And we were really like, happy when we were doing it. it nice. Funny. Yeah, and it can, for folks who didn't, who had that shift from either just just the person who made the mistake, failure bowing, and both of you failure bowing, you might have noticed a shift, right? It can feel different if, it's, if it feels like, oh my God, uh, and the other person is just standing there versus we're both failure bowing. Sometimes it, it, it can, it can feel like a release, right? And it's a difference between saying that we can kind of know like, okay, you're gonna make mistakes, but actually experiencing what is it like when you make a mistake and how do you recover from it? And how do you move forward? And it's not pretending the mistake didn't happen, right? I didn't say three when I was supposed to say two, what are you talking about? No, 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 it's like, yeah, I made a mistake. And I made a mistake, the, the failure bow is saying, I'm celebrating the risk that I took. And because I took a risk, even if the risk is relatively small and just means making eye contact with someone you've just met when you're fairly introverted, like that's taking a risk, right? Or counting in a way that you're not used to counting and knowing you might not be good at it. And so feeling that moment of, oh, 
I wasn't, I'm a smart person, but what just happened here? So you made a mistake because you've taken a risk and tried something new. So that's what the celebration is, right? That's what the failure bow is. Who got better in the last round? Yeah, yeah. And we didn't do that exercise for very long, and we all felt a greater sense of ease. So some of that is just the familiarity and the rapport with your partner, building trust even in just this little circumstance. And also, I would posit that the failure bow has something to do with it, right? Taking a moment and celebrating failure, and then moving forward together, adjusting, integrating the information. You didn't say, OK, let's have a post-mortem and figure out exactly where the mistakes are, and blah, 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 right? You just, there was some level of integration and learning that happened, and we all got better. Turn to this counting partner and say thank you to this person. Thank, thank you. you. You're going to find another partner. It's that time. Oh my goodness. You know how to do this. You're experts. Raise your hand. Be bold. Walk up to someone. Find a partner. Yeah, there's someone with their hand raised or someone with his hand raised. Yes. Yes. If you're looking for a partner, put your hands up nice and high. There's someone back there. There's look back there. Put your hand up really nice and high cuz it's a big room with lots of folks. Yeah, great. Who else is looking for a partner? Do, 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 do. There's someone here. There's someone here. Great. Oh, right here, right here. Come on, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. That's all right. That's all right. Or you can just mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you swap up here? Swap it. Swap it. You swap up here. Yeah. Okay. Great. Is there? Are we good? Anybody else? All right. So I want you to take a moment, I want you to take a moment and just independently um, kind of tee up what you might categorize as something from your life, a true thing from your life that you would categorize as a sparkling moment. So that could mean, that that's pretty open, right? It could mean something that uh, really brought you joy or delight or something that happened where, that you were really proud of, an accomplishment, just something that you would categorize as a sparkling moment, yeah? And if you're like, I, I don't know, I, I, it doesn't have to be like the most sparkling guest moment of all time in your life. Just something, it could have been something recently or from a while ago, just something that's like, yeah, cool. Okay. So uh, there's one person in each pair, you're going to be the first person to tell the sparkling moment to your partner, yeah? And uh, so one person in each pair, if you're like, I'll go first, you're both gonna tell your stories. So it's not like one person goes and the other person never goes, but whoever uh, is gonna go first, put your hand up, one person in each pair, yeah? If you're looking at your partner and both your hands are down, someone put your hands up. <laughs> Great, and put your hands down. So you're going to have one minute, I'll tell you when to begin. You're going to have one minute to share this sparkling moment with your partner. And the listener, your job is just to listen. If your partner's story ends after five seconds and they're like, I got this award, it was awesome. Okay? And they have more time, then here are two prompts that you can give this partner. Two prompts, you can say, say more. Or, what else? Yeah. So that, that is not the moment for like your hard hitting journalistic question, right? It's just kind of offering them something that might prompt them to share more. Any questions? All right, one minute. Question, yeah. Oh, uh, you have one minute. I'll tell you when the time is up for, for the person to tell their story. Yeah, the one minute for the person to tell the story, and if before, I'll ring the bell when the one minute is coming to a close. Yeah, so you have a couple more seconds to wrap up your stories. But if you don't hear the bell for a while and they've stopped talking and you're the listener, then that's when you can say, say more, or what else? Yeah? All right, off you go, one minute starting now. All right, what was that? Great, great. 
So, here's what's going to happen. Listeners, who you just heard your partner share this sparkling moment story, you're going to have one minute to tell their story back to them. Oh, I didn't tell you that round was coming. Before you get started, before you get started, people whose story is being retold, be, be kind and gentle with this person who knew not that this round was coming, yeah? Um, and don't jump in and say, you, you got it wrong, right? Just like let them tell it. And you can start with the people who are repeating the stories back, you can start with saying, I heard you say, yeah? Off you go. time for the person who was the first listener to tell your sparkling moment story to your partner. And odds are, that listener is now going to be listening really acutely, yeah? One minute starting now, off you go. All right, and now you know, you know what it's coming. You're going, listeners, you're going to repeat that story back to the person who just told it. I heard you say, off you go. All right. So you told, in this exercise, you told a sparkling moment story, something true from your life. Your partner shared it back to you. And you heard, your, your, you heard that story. And you also had the opportunity to hear someone else's story and tell it back to them. So I'm curious, anything to share from any piece of that exercise? Anything that you notice? Yeah. It feels like there was less fluff and really only like the more important details about it. When your partner repeated the story back? Yeah, it felt like kind of getting, getting to the core. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It felt more refined and smooth. Like we were able to like sometimes we played along with the word choice and like try to make it more like a cool story instead <laughs> of just <laughs> different things. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Couple. Couple other. Yeah. Oh sure. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh right over right over here after yeah. Yeah. We th we threw in some filler context too. So when the person was giving like the the reiteration of the story, it's kind of like oh yeah, and also this happened. When you were repeating the story back, you kind of embellished? No, 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 the, the other person that originally said it. Oh, I was like, you just made, you just no, made up no, this story? No, yeah. No. yeah. No. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so I don't know if it was just me, but like, I know it was a good moment in my life, right? But then the fact that someone else was repeating it back to me, it made me feel even better about the moment because like they were listening to me and like it just yeah. reminded me of like the nostalgia of the moment and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. So so there are a few things about this exercise, right? Uh, it's it can help us. We often you often hear active listening and empathy, right? Those are sort of buzzwords, and it's like yeah, yeah, of course we want to be active listeners and empathetic. Yes, 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 yes. And what often happens is that we do what we often call what what I think of, and I learned this from a teacher of mine, uh, listening to respond versus listening to understand, right? So someone telling you a story or telling you something and you're like, can't wait to respond with my brilliant thought, yeah, right? Or like, I'm teeing up my response to this rather than am I actually present and taking in what this person is sharing with me? And sometimes when it's a personal story, it can also feel like, you're not, you're not as present. So it's how, how present can you be to just listen to understand, listen to receive, versus listening to respond, yeah? All right, we have so many things to do and not that much time. So turn to this person or people and say thank you to them. Yes, yes, great. And you're gonna find
find another partner or a group of three. And I'm gonna count back from 10. When I get to one, you're gonna be in that new group. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Groups of three are okay. Groups of two or three, yeah? Great. Here, what are we, what, oh, okay, you're good. Yeah, 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 awesome. So you just had a moment, you just, in the last exercise, you shared true stories from your lives. You shared true stories from your lives. And now we're going to experiment with, with making up stories, with making up stories. Wow. <laughs> oh. So there's a tool that I'm going to share with you all that's a framework for how you're going to make up stories. And it's something that we call the story spine. So if you look up here or up here, here's the story spine, the basic elements that you're going to use to make up a story. So momentarily, you and your partner, if you're in a group of three, you'll just alternate and go through. You'll alternate the different pieces for telling the story. So one person will start with once upon a time. The next person will say every day and you'll fill in the details, right? Uh, so uh, once upon a time, there was a boy named Harry Potter who lived in a closet underneath the stairs on Privet Drive. Yeah? Every day, he was neglected by his aunt and uncle uh, and his, his terrible cousin. But one day, a giant arrived at his house and told him that he was a wizard. Because of that, he went to Hogwarts, a magical school. Because of that, he made best friends Ron and Hermione, and they went on magical adventures together. Because of that, he then ended up uh, battling Voldemort. Uh, until finally he was a hero and he saved the day. Ever since then, Harry Potter has been known as the hero of this series. Oh, I've never done that before. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. So Right, you can, and you can use more, more details in that, but we, we see the structure of the story. Once upon a time kind of sets the background, the, the, the background or backdrop of the story. Every day is the routine of that, but one day is a disruption in that routine. So just go back and forth with your partner or partners. And before you get started, a couple of notes. Because of that can be used however many times you want to. And if your partner says because, because of that, you have a choice to say because of that or until finally to start your next sentence with because of that or until finally. And at the bottom you see in brackets, the moral of the story is your choice. Your story might have a moral or not. A tip for you is that it helps if you're telling a story in the third person. So it's not once upon a time I was walking down the street. Once upon a time Penelope was walking down the street in Seattle, right? Weird story. Uh, uh, yeah, make it up. Just alternate, go back and forth. Please make some mistakes. Flag me down if you have questions. Off you go. <laughs> All right, so pause right here. Pause right here. You might have uh, told multiple stories. You might not even have gotten to the end of one story. But hopefully you got a little bit of a sense of what it's like to make up a, a story, yeah, using the story spine. So here's what's going to happen for this next round. For this next round, instead of alternating and telling a story uh, together, right, one person is going to be the narrator of the story and tell a story using the story spine structure. And the other person, or if you're in a group of three, the other people are, you're going to be the prompters. Yeah, you're gonna be the prompters. And here are the prompts that you can offer to the storyteller, color or advance. Color or advance. Um, so color means give some more detail. Give some more detail. And you can be really specific. So if I was telling the Harry Potter story, right? Once upon a time, there was a boy named Harry Potter who lived under the stairs on Privet Drive every day, right? My, my, my partner could say, color Harry Potter. What did he look like, right? He had a lightning bolt scar on his forehead. And he wore glasses. And oh, whatever the different descriptors. And, in, and when the listener, the prompter is satisfied, they'll say, advance. Let's continue with the narrative. What's the next piece of the story? 
So prompters, I invite you when you offer the prompt of color, you're not offering it to like trip them up and be like, ha ha, you can't figure it out, right? It's see if you can offer that prompt when it's like something that you're genuinely curious about or that you'd be like, what, what is that, right? Like color what the tree looked like or color um, what, whatever other, and it can use other senses as well. It might not just be visual. So one person decide that you're gonna be the storyteller in each group, other folks are the prompters. I'll put the story spine back up because, uh, can I put, yeah, here we go. Uh, so you can reference it up here and use color or advance. Off you go. <laughs> and again, you might be mid-story and you might be like, oh, I really wanted to tell the end of that story or, or I really wanted to hear the end of that story. Maybe during the scavenger hunt or later you can catch up with this person and be like, what happened? <laughs> what happened? I gotta know. But let that go right now. And I want you to take a moment and just think about what it was like to offer those prompts and what it was like to receive those prompts and what it was like to, to tell a story using this story spine. So one of the things about the, the idea of thinking about am I coloring, am I offering detail, descriptive words, more context, or am I advancing the narrative, am I getting straight to my message? to be able to be nimble with both of those things dependent on the audience, right? So again, often when we're presenting or having a meeting, we're thinking about what's my content? How am I delivering this message? Am I getting this right? Am I delivering it in this way? And we're not thinking about who am I talking to and what might they be interested in and how can I adapt to what their prompts are or their questions or concerns are. So it's not changing the core of your story but it's being able to adapt and adjust because it is a collaboration with your audience. Again, whether that's one person or a room full of people, it's not just I'm just up here. If it didn't matter if you were there in person, you could just send your deck of slides or your report or whatever but how, how can you show up and adapt to who is there. So I invite you, you know, after this weekend when you go back to your campuses, to have, this is another tool that you have, is thinking about how am I framing things? Who am I talking to? What's the feedback that I'm getting and how can I adjust in real time based on where they are? Yeah? So uh, I actually invite you to stay with this group or this partner for the next exercise, and we're gonna pivot to something that is nonverbal. So you talked quite a bit with this last partner, and for this exercise, it's going to be completely nonverbal. There's no discussion, there's no direction, there's no negotiation. You're doing this completely nonverbally. So with this partner or with your group, make sure that you have a little bit of space and a little bit of space away from the other groups, yeah, to be able to move around at least a little bit, yeah. And here's what's gonna happen. I'm going to give you a series of prompts. And the prompts are pairs of items. And your task is, with your partner, if you're in a group of three, this will be a little bit more challenging, but you're smart humans, you can figure it out, I, I believe that. Your task is to physicalize what that pair of things is without talking as quickly as possible, yeah? And so you're going to make your bodies into the shape of those things. You're not pointing to it or holding it. Uh, you're becoming that thing. And I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly. Yes, exactly, my friends, yes, exactly. So if I said knife and fork, you and your partner all concurrently must become a knife and fork. Yeah, that's it, yeah, exactly. Yep, all of you are doing that. Good, and you can let that go. If both of you are the same thing, somebody's got to adjust. That's how that works. And do it without speaking, right? The inclination is to be like, okay, do you like being a fork, or should I be a, like, or I'll, I do a great fork, let me do it, right? <laughs> You're going to do it without speaking, so there should be total silence starting now. Total silence starting now, yeah. Great. All right, I'm gonna move through them quickly. If you do something brilliant, it's gonna be gone. If you do something that you don't know what's going on, it's gonna be gone. All right, sun and moon, sun and moon. Without talking, yeah, just try something. Pen and paper. Computer and engineer, computer and engineer. Cat and dog. <laughs> professor and student, professor and student. Bee and flower, bee and flower. Angel and devil. 
Without talking, yeah, try something. Chips and salsa, chips and salsa. I don't know, yeah, try something, amazing, yeah, good. Car and driver, car and driver. Surfer and wave, surfer and wave. Peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and jelly. I don't know, yeah. Uh, coffee and donut, coffee and donut. Salt and pepper. <laughs> yeah, great, good, let that go. Give yourself some applause. Great. great. Great, take, uh, now is the time when you can converse with this person or people. Take 30 seconds and check in with them about how that went, what you noticed. So, in that exercise, somehow you figured out what to do each time. And you might have been more confused at moments or more clear at moments, but you tried something, right? And again, if both of you, if it was knife and fork and we were both standing here, we're not gonna have like a fork off. Fork off, that's a funny thing to say, right? Somebody, you might as well change. So again, it's this opportunity to see how can you adapt? You might have something in mind that you wanna do that you think should be the way it should go, but when it's actually happening, what's happening in the moment and how can you be present for that and adjust to that and support the other person or the thing that's happening there? Yeah, and be able to react and act quickly and make mistakes again. Woohoo, if you're like, how, what, who was peanut butter and who was jelly? I don't know, right? Try something. All right, uh, say thank you to this person or people. And you are going to actually find yourself in a group of about three people, about three people, off you go. All right, so this exercise is called port key. I don't always talk this much about Harry Potter. Um, but port key is a reference from Harry Potter. And for, uh, where are my Harry Potter people at? There you are, yes, hello. Yes, so if you recall, and if you are like, I hate Harry Potter, don't worry, this is not content related to Harry Potter. But uh, port key in Harry Potter, do you remember what a port key is? Does, it, does anyone remember what a port key is? Yeah. It teleports you places. It teleports you places. Yes, thank you. It's an object, like a common everyday object, like a boot, that when you touch it, it transports you to a different location. That is now all you need to know about what a port key is for this exercise. So for this exercise, with this group of about three people, this is another storytelling exercise and where you're going to be sharing true stories again from your lives. And a shift here is that these don't have to be sparkling moment stories. In fact, I invite you to share something that you might categorize as being pretty mundane. Yeah, it doesn't need to be anything that's like, oh wow, here's something that's really awesome or that I'm really proud of. It, it, but it just needs to be true. And it's going to be inspired by a prompt that someone else in your group gives you. So will someone give me just like a common everyday object, just Chair, someone said chair, yeah, great. Uh, so here's how I would start my story. If I was telling a story inspired by the word chair, I would say, chair takes me to, chair takes me to. And then I would tell a short story. So chair takes me to um, the chair that I use in my, my office that I have at home, my, my little home office. And it is this really retro chair, it's, and it's kind of ugly. It's one of those things that it's like, Ugly, like it's somewhere on the borderline of like ugly and cute. Like it's this old retro, like yellow diamond pattern. And my friend and I found it on the street and I think it's the last thing that like as an adult, I found on the street and like took into my apartment because it was just like really cute. Um, and it, I had a bright red desk for a while. So it was like bright red desk and bright yellow chair. And it, I definitely felt like this might be this might be too much, I might be overdoing it, and I got rid of that desk. So that's my chair story, right? It's like mundane, but that's what, that's what that made me think of. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to find another object that sort of exists in that memory, in that story, in that environment. So something concrete and tangible, right? Not like, 
uh, ennui, right? <laughs> Not like an abstract concept, like a, a tangible thing. So I, when I think about that, um, that apartment where I had my desk and chair right out of the window, there was this beautiful tree I would see when I was working at home. So I would give tree to somebody else in my group. And that person would say, tree takes me to, and tell a story inspired by tree. And it could be something from last week, or this morning, or five years ago. It doesn't matter. It just needs to be true. It can be mundane. When you offer that, that word, that prompt to someone else, offer it to a specific person. So it's not just like tree, right? It's like tree, right? And everyone will tell a story. Keep them pretty short. I'm not going to be, you're not going to be timing them. But know that everyone's going to tell a story. So, you know, no more than a minute or so. Any questions about the mechanics of that? Great. So with your group, you can, if you feel inspired to like sit on the floor like around a campfire, you're welcome to do that. Um, or circle up a few chairs, you're welcome to do that. Off you go. Flag me down if you have questions. Raise your hands if you did not get a chance to tell a story. Everybody. You did not get a chance, great. Uh, so just a couple more minutes. If everyone's told a story, you can keep going, right? You might have you might have already told a couple stories, but make sure everyone gets to tell at least one story. So just a couple more minutes. Yeah. All right, storytellers. Great. So you might have noticed that you might you might have told a boring story or thought you told a boring story. But I would guess that probably even if you thought you told a boring story, it, was, it wasn't boring to the people that heard it, right? So sometimes we forget that personal stories really help us get to know each other better, even if it's just a short little thing, can help us get to know each other better, and that we can bring those elements of ourselves to other parts of our lives and our interests, right? That we don't have to sort of keep these like personal bits, that it can really help enhance who you are and how you're showing up when you're presenting or sharing any content that you have, yeah? So you can keep playing this game and or play it other times in your life, but think about where can you find those personal stories and how can, again, you integrate them into your roles as student developers when thinking about how you're connecting with an audience, when you're talking to professors, when you're talking to classmates, any of those things, yeah? So uh, we're wrapping up, but uh, if you take a look up here, here are just a few things uh, that I invite you to take away and think about and, and think about integrating and incorporating uh, when you go back to your campuses. Yeah, so tools for both for showing up and for also thinking about other ways to communicate. So connect with your body and your voice before presenting. Just taking a moment to shake out, right? Shake and count, or feel grounded, or just even if it's just internally, like I am here. Okay, it's I, I deserve to take up space. Yeah. Practicing that active listening, listening to understand versus listening to respond. Thinking about who your audience is and how can you adapt to who that audience is. Your message might be at core the same, but will adapt and shift based on the context, right? And really empathizing with that audience. Look for opportunities to say yes and to offer and build. So that's what you did in telling those stories and using the story spine to make up stories. Someone said at the beginning of the session when I said, what's something you know about improv? And someone said, yes, and. And that's a core principle of improvisation, accepting and building on each other's offers. So when you're making up the story, you're building on each other's ideas looking for those opportunities, ways to build on other people's ideas and to support your own ideas. Notice what's actually happening versus your idea of what should be happening. In the knife and fork, what is your partner doing? How can you show up for that moment versus the perfect picture of what should be happening? Explore ways to frame your messages as a story and share stories from your life, right? You are more than your content. Again, if, if it's just all your content, send it, it, it with Google Slides, right? Uh, but if you, what can you bring? What can you bring if you're having a conversation? And that's just as, if not more important, than your content, yeah? So 
I invite you to take these tools out with you in the world when you go back to your campus and to continue to chat with each other and see if there are other opportunities to integrate and apply them. So look around at the storytellers that you have shared some stories with and say, thank you for the stories. Yeah, yeah, great. And, um, and take a look around the room and there have been a number of people who you've done different exercises with, shared stories, made your bodies into weird shapes, counted, made mistakes, yeah? And give everyone a round of applause. Thank you so much for your time. I know you have a scavenger hunt coming next. Enjoy the rest of your time here together at this summit.